Hi there, good afternoon. Welcome to this regularly scheduled meeting of the Intergovernmental Relations Committee this November 6, 2014. And I am joined by Council Members John Quincy, Council Member Andrew Johnson, and um, Council Vice President Elizabeth Glidden is on her way, so she will be joining us uh, fairly soon. And uh, today we just have one item on our agenda, which is a discussion item for the 2015 Legislative Agenda and Policy Positions. So if we could please get those started, that would be wonderful. Um, who would like to go first? I can hold it. <laughs> right on time. So we've been joined by the, the chair here of the committee, Council Vice President Elizabeth Wood. All right, thank you for your indulgence. As I came from another obligation, Mr. Ranieri, I hear you're up. <laughs> yes, thank you. Madam Chair, members, thank you very much. What we'd like to do is you know, introduce the legislative program, but we'd like to give a quick election update on about you know, what happened and go from there to right into the proposals. All these proposals are uh, no votes today. They receive and file, and the committee will act on these in about two cycles. And we have, uh, I think, six proposals today, and Ms. Lesh and Ms. Bergman will uh, walk us through them. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. My name is Sasha Bergman from the IGR department, and I just wanted to provide a brief update on the election this past Tuesday. Um, I'm just going to brief on the, the Minnesota legislature, uh, and I know there's been a lot of focus on kind of the federal um, Results and so I'll just um, say very briefly that the the statewide the constitutional officers um, Governor Dayton State Auditor Rebecca Otto Attorney General Lori Swanson um, all three of those were successful in their bids for re-election and then the open Secretary of State spot that was being or that is being vacated by Mark Ritchie will be held by Steve Simon starting this January who's the current um, chair of the Elections Committee in the House. So moving on to the legislature this year, the Senate, the Minnesota Senate was not up for re-election, but the House was. And um, as a result of the election, there will be a change in party control starting in the 2015 legislative session. Uh, Democrats have held the majority for the past two years, but the GOP won 11 seats that are currently being held by the DFL. Uh, with the exception of one suburban seat, all of those seats that are switching uh, were in rural areas, and there is one potential recount also in the suburbs. Um, so the new balance of power changes from 73 Democrats and 61 Republicans to 72 Republicans and 62 Democrats. And so what this means moving forward, um, this week uh, there will be elections held by the two caucuses um, to determine their leadership for speaker, uh, my majority leader, and minority leader. And once that process starts, um, the committee structure will then be determined. Right now, I think there's 30 uh, standing committees in the House to deal with you know, various jurisdictions and finance and policy. Um, and that could be modified, could be um, extended, could be shortened, could be changed altogether. So we'll see what that looks like probably in the coming weeks. And then also um, committee leadership and staff will, will change. So the GOP will be able to select new chairs for each committee. They basically um, uh, have control over the agenda for each committee um, and determine what bills are heard and, and kind of the, the path of those bills. And the staff for the committees, the partisan staff will change as well. Um, and just one final note on turnout. Uh, based on the, the numbers it looks like, or the preliminary numbers at least, uh, this election's midterm, uh, the, this midterm election's turnout was just about 50%, which is down from the past two midterm elections. In 2006, it was over 60%, and in 2010, it was approximately 56%. And so I'm not sure uh, the, the turnout based on party statewide, but uh, we have, those are the, the broad numbers at this point. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. I'm not seeing questions, um, but I do thank you very much for the report. And I'm not sure, are you facilitating uh, our presentations? Because uh, I think yeah. we're ready. Uh, Ms. Lash and I will be, and I'm going to turn it over to her. She's going to uh, have a little introductory comment. OK, thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and Council Members Melissa Lesh with the IGR Department. Um, and today we are going to begin the series of presentations that we and the city departments that are engaging in our process have been working on um, for you to hear some new legislative agenda um, proposals. Um, these are ideas that have come from the city's uh, various departments, um, some suggestions from them about uh, new items that could be included in our legislative agenda. Uh, I think the council is familiar that we have um, implemented a new policy liaison team. We began that process 
uh, last year. So this is the second year of the liaison team. And the team is a cross-section of staff from different city departments, and their responsibility is to um, solicit uh, legislative agenda ideas from their colleagues and from um, their other staff in the departments to see what they might need and ideas they have to help us accomplish our goals within the city um, and legislative changes to that effect. Uh, they meet every couple of weeks and they've vetted each other's ideas and brainstormed together and also had the opportunity for some educational presentations as well. We were fortunate to have uh, Commissioner Myron Franz with us earlier today uh, talking about um, state revenues, for example. And so the policy proposals that you'll hear today are ideas that have been vetted through this process, uh, and I think most of you are familiar with as well, um, have at least had some introductory information about these ideas. Um, today we're gonna be hearing from the city attorney's office, uh, excuse me, today we're gonna be hearing from the health department. Uh, we're gonna be hearing from uh, staff from the mayor's office to talk about the mayor's cradle decay agenda, um, the city attorney's office, and staff from CPED. Moving forward, just so you know where we're going for over the next uh, couple of cycles, uh, November 20th, we're gonna hear the remaining proposals, uh, some more from the city attorney's office, the city clerk's office, public works, and human, uh, human resources are all gonna be presenting next cycle on November 20th. Following that, on December 11th, we will be bringing forward um, a side-by-side -side for you, which will be the chair's suggested mark of uh, technical changes to the existing legislative agenda. We'll strike items that have been accomplished, change dates, um, technical changes of that nature, and we'll also be incorporating um, any new items that you hear today or hear um, at the next presentation that the committee would like to discuss more and potentially move forward. That will show up in the chair's mark, and you'll have time for discussion and debate at that time. And then we'll be looking at final adoption. Um, will actually be happening after the first of the year. Um, we're losing a, a cycle in here somehow with the holidays and everything. Uh, we don't think that will be um, anything negative at all, uh, running into session. Uh, our plan is to then move to final adoption on January 8th, uh, which is two days after the first day of session, but the first several weeks of session tend to be um, introductory and informational. We'll have a lot of new members, and so uh, the timing with that would be, would be quite appropriate. All right, I think we're ready to move forward. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and with that, I'm gonna introduce uh, Patty Bowler from the Health Department, and she's gonna be talking about um, one of their initial proposals. Ms. Bowler. Thank you, Melissa. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Patty Bowler from the Health Department. And uh, I have a brief proposal about increasing funding for HIV and STD uh, services, primarily provided by our partner, the Minnesota Department of Health. Um, they are seeking services um, for a million dollars for their HIV unit and about a million dollars for their sexually transmitted uh, disease unit, um, and that would increase our ability, since we're partners and receive community grants, would increase our ability here in Minneapolis to respond. Uh, this proposal, I think, is well supported. We're not sure if it's going to show up in the governor's budget because we don't have that information yet, but you can see on your um, your sheet here that uh, Planned Parenthood is supporting it, the Minnesota AIDS Project, and they're doing most of the lobbying. Um, a number of other supporters um, are articulated as well or um, highlighted on your sheet. I just want to also mention um, this is not just a city of Minneapolis issue. Um, certainly we have a preponderance of cases here in Minneapolis affecting our young people primarily and communities of color, but it's also a statewide issue. Um, so uh, with that, I'll, I'll just leave it at, at that unless you have any questions. Thank you very much. I'm not seeing questions. I'll just note for committee members, if you're following along, uh, these um, overview sheets provide some really helpful key information. I think for this one, as Ms. Bowler said, uh, there are a lot of partners forwarding this. This would be a very a typical one, whereas recommended here, it is not uh, an item where the city is the lead, but we support a coalition. So, and then you see that reflected. All right, what's our next item, please? Uh, Madam Chair, uh, next we'll hear from uh, Diane Halsey from the Mayor's Office to talk about proposals number, proposal numbers two, three, uh, four, and five in your packets. All right. Thank you, Ms. Halsey. Thank you, Sasha, um, Madam Chair, and members of Council. I am <clears throat> here today to talk about these policy proposals that 
have come through the uh, mayor's, Mayor Hodges' cradle to cake cabinet. Um, the cabinet is, um, is primarily made up of, there's about 28 members and they come from a wide variety of people in the community, healthcare members, um, early childhood providers, um, parents, um, just a number of professionals as well. And <clears throat> they have formed three committees out of each of the goals of the Cradle Decay Cabinet. Early experiences, um, stable housing, and continuous access. And each of these committees also have additional members from the community that are on it. And um, these, so these policy recommendations have come through this process um, where the committees have developed, discussed what um, is important to them this session and also has been reviewed by the entire cabinet. And so what you're seeing before you today is a, com you know, a culmination of all these efforts. I also want to highlight that each of these are just for, we're just asking for support, that the city would not be the lead, but would support other efforts that are happening um, for these each of these pieces of legislative uh, policies. The first one is also in conjunction with the health department, and that's on home visiting services. Um, this is a, home visiting is a proven and effective approach um, that the city of Minneapolis has been invested in for quite some time. And um, right now, this, um, this particular piece is just encouraging and wanting the state to give more funding for this home visiting. Um, the city of Minneapolis is um, uh, the funding that comes from the federal government right now um, to provide home visiting services is at risk. And so we are now going to the state to ask for them to help support for these, these services. I don't know if there's any questions on this one. Yeah, so I think, um, and I'm not seeing any questions, but thank you for that. Okay. The next one is on expansion of early learning scholarships. And this one is um, a statewide issue, but does directly affect um, many children in Minneapolis. Uh, this is um, an equity issue as well. There's huge um, racial disparities right now in terms of which children are prepared for kindergarten. Um, and high quality early learning, um, having access to high quality early learning is definitely one of the ways in which we help prepare kids for kindergarten. So this particular uh, policy ask is just um, supporting the broad-based support that's already out there through the Mini Minds campaign, um, the Governor's Early Learning Council, um, and many other, um, there's about 80 or 90 people, uh, organizations that are part of this whole campaign that are supporting um, increased um, funding for early learning scholarships. Um, this is something that has been before this legislature over the past couple of years and um, to date has earned $27.65 million um, annually. Um, however, um, even with this great funding that's been acquired, it still leaves about 1,500, uh, about 1,500 children that are still unable, 15,000, I'm sorry, children that are still unable to access scholarships. So it only hits at about maybe 10% of them. So are there any questions about that one? The next one um, has to do with um, Part C early intervention. And just as a little background, what Part C is, um, is an early intervention service that is eligible to, for infants and toddlers age of birth to three. And currently it serves, it gives services for those that may have developmental delays. And this would include physical therapy, speech therapy, nutrition, family counsel counseling, et cetera. Currently, you have to, um, a child has to uh, test, um, I think it's one and a half standard deviations um, against the mean um, to apply to be able to be eligible for these services. This particular piece of policy is, is requesting that all homeless children now be um, automatically, without testing, able to access these services. Uh, many homeless children, because of their high mobility and poverty, already are um, have experienced devel developmental delays, um, but this provides added and extra support for these children. Um, and this one particular is being led by the Children's Defense Fund, um, who is also supporting this. Okay, and the last one, 
we have is around, um, again, is the access issue, um, making sure that um, uh, young children have access to high quality uh, early learning, but this one <clears throat> is around um, support for child care assistance program. Um, our goal here is to make uh, child care afford affordable and accessible to all parents and families. And um, there, are, there are some recommended changes to the system. So this is just basically recommending and supporting any kind of policy that would make it affordable um, and also um, any kind of policy that would help us to reduce, um, especially here in Hennepin County, Minneapolis and Hennepin County, which has um, very long wait lists for basic sliding fee. Um, we're supportive of any kind of um, policy that will reduce that waiting list, um, whether that means an increase in funding, a change in the way that it's um, the way that it's calculated now. But this supports anything that would make um, a basic sliding fee and child care assistance um, more accessible to families. And so, and just to reiterate too, this is funding for low income families. So you have to be at at least, I think, 115% um, of poverty to even be eligible for child care assistance and um, uh, a little bit above that for to be eligible for basic sliding fee. So this is clearly an equity issue as well. Any questions on that? All right. Well, I'm not seeing questions. I mean, just for you to know, I think you're not seeing questions because these are items that have strong agreement and strong support. And um, uh, I think many of us have heard about these items before mm -hmm. and think it's very appropriate that the Cradle Decay, um, what is it called, a group, a committee, um, has identified these as a focus for the legislative session. So thank you. I think kind of the, the challenge is, of course, a lot of these are about funding priorities. Mm -hmm. And uh, hopefully we can find some agreement on the importance of these priorities. So thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Uh, Madam Chair and Council Members, I think I have a, an easy no-brainer one for you for the next one. Um, we're going to be hearing from you. The, always say when you say that you're sort of. <laughs> maybe I promise this okay. one. This one's an easy one. I promise. Um, then we're going to be hearing from the City Attorney's Office. State law currently, as you know, bans texting while driving. It does not, however, ban playing video games on your phone while driving. So I hope my husband's watching. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to ask uh, I'm going to ask uh, the city attorney's office to come up and talk about playing uh, video games while driving. Okay, and there looks, Ms. Uh, Councilmember Johnson, did you need a comment now, or did you want to wait for the president? I guess I could wait until after that. All right, because yeah, well, anyway, I think let let's hear what the what the proposal is, and then we can take some comment and discussion, and and folks might want to do that. So. We are ready. Um, Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Tim Richards. I'm a supervising attorney in the criminal division at the city attorney's office. And I am here to discuss a uh, proposed amendment to Minnesota statute 169.475. It's entitled use of wireless communications device, but it's much better known as the texting while driving statute. The provision reads very simply, no person may operate a motor vehicle while using a wireless communications device to compose, read, or send an electronic message when the vehicle is in motion or a part of traffic. So this provision, this, this uh, provision in essence bans reading, writing, and sending uh, electronic messages while operating a vehicle. And electronic messages, as it is defined in this statute, um, encompasses emails, it encompasses text messages, instant messaging, accessing the internet, um, and basically any type of communication uh, where uh, one physical device is transmitting to another physical device. Um, there are some exceptions in this statute. Uh, most notably, uh, there's an exception for using your uh, mobile device in a voice-activated or hands-free mode that is not banned by the statute. Um, there is an exception for making cell phone calls uh, or dialing cell phone numbers to make those calls. That is not banned by the statute. Um, for obtaining emergency assistance, and there is an exception for authorized emergency vehicles to use it uh, in the performance of their duties. Those are all exceptions. The purpose of this statute, of course, is to provide law enforcement with a mechanism to combat the distracted driving that is associated with handheld communication devices. And something that, this is something that has unfortunately uh, become an epidemic over the past several years. 
And it aims to do this while preserving the right to make cell phone calls and to engage in hand-free use of the communication device. Um, there are two basic problems with this statute, however, that we have learned since its inception in 2008. First is that the law bans distracting acts like texting or reading emails, but it fails to ban many other distracting behaviors that drivers do use wireless devices for, um, such as looking at photos or schedules on your phone, typing memos, browsing music lists, and yes, as was in the introduction, playing video games. Um, none of these acts are covered by the statute because the statute is limited quite simply to composing, reading, and sending electronic messages. Um, now, this shortcoming is significant with respect to video games, for example, when you factor in that since the enactment of this law in 2008, the wireless app market, if you know what that term means, it means the mobile apps that you can download onto your phone, uh, which includes the video game app market, has skyrocketed. Um, the wireless gaming market is expected to be a $14 billion industry by the year 2017. In addition, browsing through our music lists while we drive is also likely to become an increasing distractor now that the sales of digital music have surpassed uh, physical sales of music. Um, so as the wireless gaming and digital music industries grow and as people rely more heavily on their phone cameras as their primary source for taking pictures, uh, these omissions from the statute are voids that will have an increasing effect on public safety. The second problem is one of enforcement. Um, quite simply, police are having difficulty enforcing this provision. Uh, police officers see drivers typing on their devices while they drive or while they sit in traffic. Um, they don't know, however, whether the drivers are using their phones to text or to email as the statute would prohibit or to conduct other types of activities uh, such as looking at photos stored on their device, rifling through lists of music, or playing a video game, which are not specifically covered by this statute. Police see the typing, but they often rely on the driver to confess to the behavior when they are citing them, uh, and that creates real enforcement issues. Those enforcement issues, I think, have been highlighted by the fact that since 2008, my office has only prosecuted 122 citations issued under this statute. In addition, of the 17 cases that have gone to trial, we have lost six of these trials, um, at least in some cases because we could not define the driver's specific behavior. So our suggestion is to request an amendment to Minnesota Statute 169.475 that would close this loophole while preserving drivers' rights to make phone calls and use their mobile devices in a hands-free, voice-activated manner. And through such an amendment, it would have the potential to both increase public safety and, uh, as important, uh, it would enable police to better enforce this law. So that is all uh, right. My Thank proposal. you. So we've got a state law that needs uh, modernizing, uh, might be one way to put it, and it's essentially unenforceable. So, um, Councilmember Johnson, did you want to um, want to make sure you got your opportunity? And then Councilmember Cano also has a question or comment. Thank you. I thought. Uh, my questions were pretty much answered by this around enforceability. I also wonder if we have unintended consequences from this law because uh, obviously texting while driving is a, a bad thing, but uh, whereas somebody might text while holding up and keeping their eyes on the road versus now if they're worried about getting caught, they hold their phone down low and they keep looking down and away from the road. Um, and become even uh, less safe with their actions uh, if we're ultimately seeing the unintended consequences outweighing the positive of uh, an issue that's very hard to enforce. So. And, and uh, Madam Chair, uh, Council Member Johnson, that is, is a, a very likely residual effect of this statute. I have no statistic or study to cite uh, for that conclusion, but, but it, it certainly is a, a common sense reaction to the limitations of the statute. Thank you. Councilmember Cano. I have two questions. One is, uh, would these proposed changes still allow drivers to have their phone in their hand, look up a contact, call them, and do this? And then my second question is, what's your sense of the overall support for this kind of change? Are there other groups 
uh, municipalities, other, you know? Well, the, the statute certainly could be uh, amended in that respect. It would depend on our choice of wording in, in the amendment. It would certainly allow for phone calls. And through allowing for phone calls, it would allow you to dial your phones. Whether it would allow you to search for contacts um, is, is something that it, it wouldn't have to do, but that it could do depending on how it was drafted. Um, the searching for contacts is, is not something that I believe to be covered by the current statute. In other words, I think that is behavior that uh, by my reading of the statute would currently not be permitted. Um, an amendment wouldn't change whatever interpretation would currently exist unless we wrote something in to affirmatively make that change. Um, and in answer to, to part two of your question, um, um, I, I think that uh, certainly Minnesotans for safe driving would, would be uh, hopefully a partner in, in uh, bringing this forward. They would be supportive of it. Um, one of their part of their mission statement is is involves distracted driving. Um, I know police are are very frustrated by the uh, the current wording of this provision. Um, it doesn't allow for enforcement. I'm not sure how widely known that is, uh, but because it is so difficult to enforce, that has frustrated police agencies. I've spoken to many of them. Um, beyond that, I, I can't answer your question. I, I don't know uh, what kind of support. Uh, does or does not exist for this. Okay, Councilmember Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm wondering uh, what the opinion of the technology industry is around this, because I know uh, there might be some solutions there, certainly within the operating systems on an Android phone, for instance. It knows whether you are walking, if you are biking, or if you are driving, because obviously if you're going 55 miles an hour, you're probably not biking and you're probably not walking. So I'm wondering if there's been an attempt by the industry to try to solve this problem. Um, and to give you an example, in my car with the GPS, I cannot type on it when the vehicle is moving. It actually prevents that behavior. And uh, I understand it's a little more complicated with cell phones because you could have passengers that very well, you wouldn't want to necessarily limit their ability to look up an address that you're headed to or what have you. Um, but there might be some possible uh, solutions within the tech world. So um, do we know much about what's going on there around this issue? Madam Chair, Council Member Johnson, smarter people than myself are, are in charge of, of uh, where that road is headed. Um, my, uh, my research into distracted driving and, and texting while driving and, and video game playing while driving, um, I, I haven't encountered uh, articles or studies that have talked about those measures. Um, that doesn't mean that they're not out there. Uh, clearly, you uh, you have cited one example, which is out there. So um, the, uh, the prospect of, of that technology being introduced as this problem becomes an increasing issue um, is, is certainly out there. Um, but, but I can't answer your question with regards to, to where specifically the field is at right now. And then do we already have laws in place to prevent watching a movie while driving? I mean, are we, do we have to worry about um, and creating an exhaustive list with legislation uh, when it comes to something like this? Well, yes, there are laws that prevent watching movies while driving. Um, we don't need to worry about creating an exhaustive list and itemizing. Um, the, an amendment can be crafted in such a way as to cover behavior uh, for example, that, that would involve uh, manipulating the screen or the, the keyboard of the device. Uh, that would be one way to craft the amendment um, that would cover what we want it to cover while exempting what we want it to exempt without the need to create an itemized list of uh, forbidden behaviors. And then I guess this is a question uh, for our chair around uh, whether or not we are, is this merely just bringing this to our attention? Are we actually voting on anything today regarding this? 
So thank you. Um, and, and so I think we'll kind of from this, we're going to move on to our next presentation. But just to ask, answer the procedural questions, I think this was a good discussion. I think it kind of shows this is one that's going to generate a lot. It may not be quite as easy as you think. <laughs> uh, anytime you talk about technology and dealing with multiple situations and different theories on what you should and shouldn't do in the car. And it also looks like we have some work to do around getting partners. Um, so that also is an area that looks a little bare. Um, so so just, again, kind of knowing this will be one I think that generates more conversation than you might think. So um, our procedure around the uh, adoption is that we are hearing presentations. We're receiving, and you can go ahead and take a seat. Um, we're receiving and filing today as we will at our next committee. And then uh, I think the date when we're actually planned to vote and adopt would be in early January by the time we go through all the presentations that allow us. So there's time to ask additional questions um, as we continue to prep up these items. Great. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I would just encourage staff, especially around um, seeing if there is, I, and I know it might be hard to find, but any data around that unintended consequences of, of, is this law actually making the roads less safe for us? Uh, and then seeing what the tech industry might have in terms of solutions. Yeah. I, th I think it's a good question, and it's just a heads up, I think, to us of what questions legislators might ask, um, which we want to anticipate as we bring forward items if we do go ahead and support this, which I would suspect we would. So, um, all right. Thank you, Madam Chair and Council Members. The final proposal is... Uh, uh, for a special law that would, regarding tax increment financing, it would only impact the city of Minneapolis. And so I am going to um, ask Ann Calvert from CPED to come up and present the item. Thank you. All right, Ms. Calvert, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I'm hoping we can, we have a little bit of a PowerPoint show here, so I'm hoping we can shift to that. Good. Okay, I want to start out with a little bit of orientation to the Upper Harbor Terminal. This is a piece of property that the city owns. It's 48 acres. You'll see on the aerial here that it is um, stretches along the riverfront. You can see the Lowry Avenue bridge there. So it starts just north of Lowry, goes up to just north of Dowling Avenue, which is where there's a, an entrance exit off of 94. It mostly runs along the river, but there is a piece of it that goes all the way back to 94. And this property has been owned by the city for decades and has been operated as a barge shipping terminal. It's the uppermost place you can get to on the Mississippi River with a barge. And that operation has been going on for years. You can see from the condition of some of the buildings uh, or the structures, I should say. Um, and that that condition will be changing in the near future, um, partly because above the falls master plan update has determined that we are gonna be closing the terminal and then shifting it over to new uses. And it's guided in that plan for a combination of park uses right along the river and then business park development on the inland parts of the site. Um, so we have a, a lot of potential on the site and very excited about that. And then the other reason it needs to change is that the lock is closing. So clearly it can no longer continue to operate as a, a Why don't you just shipping. remind us why the lock's closing? The lock is closing because of the threat of Asian carps. So Congress took and the, the president signed a law that says that the upper St. Anthony Falls lock right at St. Anthony Falls needs to close. So we have been looking quite a bit at the development potential up there, and um, we think it offers a lot of potential for the city because, first of all, there's potential for a major new park amenity that I think North Minneapolis has been very eager to get and is very deserving of. Uh, it's a major asset, 48 acres is probably worth millions of dollars, and we would like to get those land proceeds for the city's behalf. It also has potential for a great deal of private investment. Some of our initial numbers show at least 100 million of private investment that can happen on the development parcels. And finally, we think there's gonna be space there for 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 jobs, which are something that could be very important to helping the economic vitality in North Minneapolis. Uh, but to get to that redevelopment, there are gonna be some additional investments needed. Um, we need to do a lot of site preparation and clearance. Um, really isn't very well served. If you've driven down Dowling to get into the, the site, beware for your suspension and your tires. We need a great deal of new streets and utilities. There's an overhead power transmission line uh, that needs to be relocated. And then the park board, of course, will be constructing parkway trails and amenities. We're estimating that our city investment is going to be somewhere in the range of 10 million. And of course, we're going to be looking for grants and um, applying for whatever we can. 
and we hope that the land proceeds will be able to be plowed back into helping to fund it. But we do think that tax increment financing is a tool that could help meet some of these needs for funding. And tax increment, um, for those of you who are somewhat newer to the, the topic, is a tool that is allowed by state statute, a very complicated state statute that creates the parameters in which we can use that tool. So we have been noodling around with some ideas on ways that we think it could work better for the site because it has a number of challenges. First of all, in order to qualify for a redevelopment tax increment district, there are certain criteria that the site has to be a certain amount improved and then a certain number of the buildings, the, the buildings need to be substandard. Well, many of the improvements that you see out there, we're told just technically are not buildings. So even though they're in terrible condition, and I think we'd all agree they're blighted, they're not buildings that allow us to qualify for the district. So it makes it a challenge to qualify certainly the whole site and even the parts that are improved because they don't qualify as buildings. Second of all, it's a big site and we think it's gonna take a number of years. And under the existing law, once you create a tax increment district, you have to spend the money in five years or it all goes poof. And so that is one of the challenges because um, we think it might take longer than that. And then many of the public improvements are things like roads or utilities that stretch out for blocks. And often the way the tax increment law works now, you really have to create districts kind of a development at a time. And it's kind of hard to fund one long street if you can only fund it a piece at a time. And there's a little bit of ability under the existing law to do some sharing from project to project. But what we're proposing is that we would be able to take all of the tax increment from any tax increment district in the site, pull it all together so we could do something like a road. So some of the things we are thinking about that would be ways to allow us to use that tool as efficiently as possible is first of all, we could just ask the state to say, the whole site qualifies as a redevelopment district. You can create one big district, you can do pieces, but it all qualifies. You don't need to get into the weeds with these details about, is it a building or not? Um, there also, there is a requirement that once you create the district, you're supposed to use 90% of the revenues to um, correct the problems that were, caused the need for the district. But if there is no qualification, we don't need that criteria. Um, Another thing I, I realize I forgot to mention is that even the, the buildings that are blighted, we don't want to be in a position, because right now the existing law says that if you tear down a building, you have to create a district within a fairly short time frame after that, or you can no longer use that building to qualify. So we don't want to have to hang on to buildings that there's no purpose for just to preserve blight so that we can keep using tax increment. Um, we, right now, that property has been tax exempt for decades because it's been owned by the city. So we're proposing that it would keep the base value for the tax increment district at zero so that we would get the maximum benefit from the tax increment and then would allow us to have up to 10 years after we would create a district to do whatever kind of expenditures we would need. And as I said, allow us to be able to share within districts within the redevelopment project would allow us to do some sharing. So our thought is that we would go into the, the legislature with some one or combination of, of these items and request special, special legislation for this area. If we get the special legislation, that does not obligate us to use tax increment as a tool. That would still be something we would be bringing back to the council with a, an explanation for why we think that is a good idea if, when we get to that point, but at least would allow us to use that tool as efficiently as we can. And then what we're tentatively thinking, tax increment districts technically always need to be located within a project. There is already something called the North Washington Industrial Project, which you see outlined in the blue there. The area that's um, south of Lowry is already certified as a tax increment district and is part of the consolidated project that helps support the neighborhoods. So what we're thinking about is just to keep it simple, proposing that every we can create tax increment districts anywhere north of Lowry within that redevelopment project. That would then allow us some of the public improvements we would like to do extend off of the site and back to Washington Avenue or even back across the freeway. So that would give us some flexibility along that line if we included the, the terminal site plus the area around it. But what geographical area this would affect is something that obviously could be thought about as well. So we wanted to share that these concepts with you, see if you had any input that would help inform moving forward, but those were some of the ideas we had. Any questions? Thank you. So um, 
just for me to kind of do a little bit, and it looks like we do have some some questions of a um, bit of a summary, and I will say um, this is a great presentation. It really um, brought to life uh, more of what you're talking about. I think I understood the big concept in that um, this area is certainly a priority for the city to figure out how we're going to make productive use of this um, great asset to the city um, that has a lot of challenges, but this uh, was really helpful. Um, if it's not already, we want to make sure that the presentation is linked, um, and maybe it already is. Um, so uh, the need, um, just to kind of synthesize here, is this is uh, perhaps an unusually large project, so the length of time within which to address such a large parcel seems to be a factor, mm -hmm. as well as the unusual nature of what was the use on the site, which doesn't fit current legislation, which is geared more towards addressing buildings as those are defined as structures. Mm -hmm. So we have some unusual things that were built that need to be addressed that are blighted items that don't fit um, the um, the uh, current legislation. Um, uh, I mean, some of the, and it's good uh, to see that you have presented some options because I think clearly we're going to want to piece through those options to identify what are really the most palatable items that make this something that um, we can get approved. Often TIF generates a lot of discussion at the legislature and um, mm -hmm. and it generates a lot of conversation at the city as to what is appropriate use of TIF. And so and it's not unique to the legislature, it's unique it's at the city too. We try to be very cautious and sparing in our uses of TIF. So thank you for giving us that range, knowing that we're gonna have to kind of parse through that. Um, Councilmember Cano. Um, thank you, um, Madam. Uh, Chair, I'm trying to put my my thoughts together here. So, so I'm I'm seeing that, that in the mayor's 2015 budget, there's a proposed $250,000 allocation from the consolidated TIF to fund Upper Harbor Terminal planning. Can you speak to how that? Can you tell me more about what that means? That Upper Harbor Terminal planning, who's going to be doing it? Is the city doing it? Are we contracting a consultant to do it? For how many years is that planning supposed to go on for? And how that relates to this plan that you're proposing right now? And I will say we can do a little bit on this, but I just want to make sure we stay on topic of the proposed um, mm -hmm. legislation. So, um, yes, mm -hmm. Madam Chair, Councilmember Cano. Um, yes, we have done a lot of preparatory work and planning so far. We're just wrapping up a, a major technical study at the moment, but there's still work that needs to be done on the site. It really needs to be extensively tested as far as environmental and geotechnical conditions. We think it's pretty good, but we need to make sure that's true. Um, with all the public improvements, there's a, before you can build the road, you have to design the road. And so there's a great deal of that sort of stuff to be done. And there are some of the things that we hope in the long run, the big capital expenses will be able to fund with land proceeds or grants or maybe tax increment. But some of these preparatory expenses tend to be the kind of things that don't qualify for a grant program or something. So I, we are expecting that there will need to be in the next few years some expenses, and to be candid, we could easily use more than the 250000 if we want to really go at this fairly quickly in order to tee up the site, get the information we need to attract developers in, and get ourselves in a position to be able to apply for grants and move fairly quickly when we get development proposals in. The language of business park, is that, does that mean that we're envisioning sending this off to the M? the Minneapolis Park and Rec Board, or do you imagine the city owning this for a while? Madam Chair and Council Member Cano, um, and I realize I, sh I should have explained the funding that the mayor is proposing would, would go probably to CPIB. We quite possibly would be hiring consultants to do the work, but we would be overseeing it. Business park is, is a term that we will be a new zoning category, and it would be a private development category. So what we are envisioning is something that is a 21st century business park where you have office, maybe think Coloplast headquarters, um, maybe some light industrial, some um, R&D tech uses, maybe institutional uses of some sort, perhaps some mixed uses because all of those things maybe need a restaurant or some convenience retail, but it would be, the part that would be business park would be not the park board, the land right along the riverfront would be the park board and they would extend the parkway and trails 
that run along the rest of the riverfront up through that area, and we're in discussions with them about how much of the site do they get. But part would be the park board, and they would be funding that part. So what we're looking at is what does it cost for the city public improvements that we're going to need for the private development. Thank you. All right. Uh, Councilmember Quincy, and again, we want to focus on uh, kind of the development as a whole and the proposal around TIF. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, I, I appreciate this because we're not talking about a, a TIF plan adoption or modification. This is just about the legislation. Mm -hmm. And uh, all very good uh, points to bring up. Uh, my question is, um, do, does the legislation address the question of the partners in the other jurisdictions? Or is this just the city of Minneapolis or would Hennepin County be a part of the TIF district as well? Madam Chair and Councilmember Quincy, at this point, because this has been mostly an internal technical discussion, we haven't reached out to other partners that would be affected. I think the other taxing jurisdictions, as I said, the, the base has been zero for years. And so I don't think any, I trust none of them are building their finances around assuming they're going to get taxes from here. Um, we have included the county and deed in, in some of the planning work that we've been doing. And so if this looks like something that there's support for continuing to explore, then we would be reaching out to other partners to make sure that we know what their perspectives are and take those into account. Council Member Andrew Nelson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I have a comment and a question. Uh, the comment uh, is that I'm kind of surprised we'd be putting industrial along the river. I would think that it would be a, a prime location for people to live and enjoy the recreational amenities. I know you did mention some mixed use there, but uh, I, I sure hope we can focus on uh, livability along the river uh, and that gets tied into all this planning. Uh, the question is, with this proposed special, special legislation, will it be possible to essentially reimburse with the TIF funding for expenses related to the study and work now? And why I'm asking that is, could we potentially, this budget cycle, increase beyond the 250000 in order to ramp it up faster, knowing that special legislation would then allow us to reimburse back into the reserves uh, if we do tap the reserves in order to ramp this up. Madam Chair and Council Member Johnson, I don't think we could do that. I don't think there's a reimbursement provision. We certainly can explore that with the attorneys and the finance folks. I, I, I appreciate the creative thinking. We need that kind of creative <laughs> thinking. Yeah. Um, ah. But it, it could be that more we could, I look at it that if we can use tax increment effectively, then it could be that the land proceeds that we would get could be used to reimburse us in effect for earlier expenses because we don't need them to build the roads, for example. So we may get to another place of helping cover some of the earlier expenses, but a, a little different mechanism. Well, I would certainly appreciate that effort uh, ahead of budget markup. And as we look into this, I think it's obviously a very important project, a priority in the city. And if there's any way for us to uh, help move it along even faster, uh, I think that's probably something a lot of us would be interested in. Thank you. All right, I'm not seeing other questions, so um, I think we are ready to go ahead and receive and file our presentations for today. Um, I will say to committee members, um, uh, that um, it seems like some of these have definitely generated uh, just conversation and questions about the projects and you should feel f free in the interim to ask uh, uh, staff questions and follow up on that and if we need to we can bring information back at a future date to make sure that within the committee itself we have an update to the presentation if that ends up being needed so um, again we were not intending to take action today but just uh, do a certain amount of our presentations and with that I think we are ready to receive and file so I will move to receive and file all in approval please say aye aye, aye. Opposed and we have done our business for today. We have concluded it. So we are adjourned. Thank you very much